Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to season two, episode number 12 of The Music Spring. This is the 16th of July, 2014. Please let me welcome your host for today's show, Lisa Farr. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of The Music Spring, where we're going to be discussing the very important topic of planning a music release. For me, particularly, this is quite an important episode because I'm heavily in planning for my next album, which we start work on next year. And uh, I'm taking a very different approach because I'm putting so much planning into this album. And, and this is a lot of the reason why we thought something like this was going to be such an important episode. As the music model develops, we're starting to realise that we really do have to start acting like small business owners. And in order to have a successful business with longevity and all those really great things like a revenue stream and networks and things like that, we really do have to put a lot more effort into the planning of things. And more and more I'm seeing seeing artists really toss up in their head of is there really any point of planning an episode, uh, planning a, uh, a music release. And uh, joining me today we have Carlos Castillo in the US. Hey Carlos. Hey everybody. And we have Lena Sawamba in the UK. Hey Lena. Hi. <laughs> Lena, why don't we start with you. Tell us uh, who you are and what you do and why you're such an, uh, a gun at what you do. Oh, okay. Well, um, I run Positive Music, which is a training provider to the music industry, and it's, I specialize in digital business and entrepreneurship training. So that's what I do. Excellent. Oh, and um, why am I such a gun? Uh, that's the second part of the question. Why am I such a gun at what I do? Well, <laughs> I have uh, two music business degrees, um, you know, over 13 years professional experience in this industry now. Um, I've worked with um, all the major labels in some capacity and run international, well I've run global campaigns for superstar artists from Beyonce to take that. So um, in terms of releases right across the board, you know, I haven't just worked on superstar artists, it's been, you know, independent as well. So um, awesome. that, that's, um, that's my experience. Yeah. Awesome. And Carlos, tell us about your experience and, and what you're doing now. Well, I've been a musician all my life. Uh, from as long as I can remember, I'll play anything that you put in front of me. Not particularly well, but whatever it is, I like to bang on it, strum it, blow into it. You know, I've always just loved music. Uh, never really aspired to be a, a professional, you know, musician per se. But I've always wanted to be part of the part of the industry. I've always been around independent musicians. Um, in fact, I got my start in the industry about 16 years ago. You know, parking cars and cleaning up trash at festivals, and that's really where my passion uh, started for independent musicians. Just being around that scene and around those hardworking people that are trying to make a go at it. Uh, from there, I've I've worked in every possible level of uh, of support, uh, event production, recording, uh, kind of, and finally landed where I'm at now with with web design and strategy consultation. Um, basically, what I've done is I've built a blog and an audience over at Shwilly Family Musicians, where we just try to provide the best information for independent musicians to to take you know control of the tools that are available to them and and make a living at their at their passion. Um, I'd say the most important thing I bring to the table, why I rock at this, is is because I come from the pa fan perspective. I was always the guy at the festivals, right up front stage, inside the sound, I used to say. And uh, that's really why I'm so good at helping musicians build relationships with their fans, which really is, is the key to uh, making a living in, as a musician today, I believe. And you have an MBA, don't you? Yes, yes. My, I have, uh, you know, business educational background. I did more years than I'd like to remember uh, working in the corporate world, and uh, so a couple years ago, I just made the transition into my passion, which is which is being around music and helping, you know, musicians make a living at their passion. And I've brought my educational background and and the the passion that I have as a fan to to that work, and uh, that's what I'm doing right now. Brilliant, brilliant. So, but. Here what we have today is we have people who have a strategic background in, in business and who have a heavily embedded passion in music. You can't get a better combination of people to talk about how to plan a release in music. So let, Lena, let's start with you. Uh, what are the key elements of planning a release? Um, ooh, okay, so I would say firstly it's knowing your target audience. Mm -hmm. um, 
pretty much everything stems from there. And you know, if you are a really new act and you don't know who your target audience is, you know, you really are just starting out, then it would be who you imagine that t target audience to be. Um, so that is really where you would start. That, um, then I would look at timing um, and I would look at um, overall strategy. Um, so for example, you know, where are you going to be doing your promo and um, in, in, in what combination. So those are kind of like, it's like the real kind of basis in terms of key elements. Awesome. Oh, I can elaborate on later. Yeah, well, we're going to do some serious elaborating, yeah. <laughs> let me tell you. And Carlos, when should, when should bands start, look at, start looking at planning their release? Is it, you know, they re record an album and they think, okay, I've got an album now, now what should I do? Or should something like that happen before they start recording their release? Um, well, the thing to consider is when you release an album or you release music, you want to have someone to sell it to. Mm -hmm. So you really need to plan ahead before you start recording, before you even start writing the music, uh, kind of to build what, what Lena was talking about. You've got to know your audience and you've got to start building that audience. Uh, the time to, to start building your audience is, is 12 months before you release music, not 30 days. And that's one of the biggest mis mistakes I see musicians making is they've got all their awesome music in the bag. Uh, and they don't contact me until it's time to master it, and they're a few weeks before it's it's getting shipped, and they and they want to start promoting it. But you need if you want to have good numbers to sell those that music to, you need to figure out who you're going to sell it to, and start start collecting that contact information and building your email list a year in advance. Now, some bands would sit and say, "Are you serious? Like, I just want to play music. Like, why do I have to do this fan building thing?" Uh, t talk to us why we have to ha start engaging those fans early. What's the point? Um, well, I was. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I would say well, number one, I would say that you know, if you if you are a, a music creator, that the first thing is it, you. I believe that you are uh, uh, creating that music in service of the fans. So mm -hmm. that's to me, that's kind of the first thing. Number two, I, I would say that um, you want to uh, really um, understand your fans early on and allow um, your fans to develop with you and allow yourself to develop with your fans. And, you know, this is something that, you know, I've, I've done with major label campaigns. You know, you, we, you get an artist in and you can start really, really early on. It might even be two years, you know, um, and start you, you start engaging with fans, um, start talking to them, um, it, you know, and, and it's what we call sort of like feed, feed, little, little. You kind of put little, little snippets out there, little snippets of content out there, you know, tracks, interviews, that kind of thing, um, in, in order to, to build a relationship with those fans and in order to um, be on... On the radar, on you know, consistently have a you know have a presence with them. So that's why you want to to, to start early. I mean, the, the the stronger the relationship with your fans and the deeper the relationship with your fans, the more the more they are, the more likely they are to travel with you on your musical journey. And I I I, can't, I believe that that's what fans want to do. They want to go on a journey with you, you know. Mm. So um and so it, that's where it all stems from. So and. And that's what I mean by knowing your audience. You know, um, you know, who are they? Where do they hang out? Um, you know, online and offline. You know, um, what kind of things are they into? Are they into lots of diff any different types of causes? All that kind of stuff. The more you know about your fans in that context, the more able you are to speak to them. The more able you are to relate to them. Um, so that that's why it's important in terms of planning a release. Once you have that information, once you have that data, then it all stems from there. Yeah. You know, it all stems from there, yeah. Carlos, what would you add to, to the idea of why it's important to have that and build that fan engagement? Uh, well, first I want to say that the attitude that I only want to be a musician purely as an artist, that's an absolutely valid reason to play music. That's why I play music. I only play it because I enjoy it. No other reason. Mm -hmm. That being said, the other side of the coin is a musician who is only a musician will never be a professional musician. 
because if you're trying to make a living, this is a business, and you have to address uh, and and cultivate that aspect of what you're doing. So mm -hmm. if you only want to be an artist, that's absolutely fine. That's the boat I'm in. But if you're trying to make your living at this, you really have to look at the, the bigger picture and, and take responsibility for your c career. And you can't leave important stuff like that up to other people. So mm -hmm. you need to take the responsibility. And like I said before, you know that that fet relationship with the fans is what's going to give you the ability to sell the music later. And as a business decision, that's what you really need to invest uh, a lot of time and, and effort into if you want to make a living this way. That that raises an interesting point and uh, some a contentious issue that I I have with um, so, some of my friends and I when we discuss this. Some of them will refer to. Uh, our fans or the consumers of our music as customers and others really don't like that that word because uh, they feel that that belittles the the artist fan relationship. Carlos, what's your opinion on the idea that we need to start viewing the fans of our music as customers? Well, you know, I think that that whole argument is basically a semantic argument. Call them whatever you want, but you know, they really need to be your friends. Is, is the best way to build a relationship to them, but in business lingo, they are customers. So you need to yeah. do what it takes to get them to buy your music. Now that doesn't mean you're engaging in any sort of, see the reason why people don't like that word is because, you know, they think marketing is sleazy. Um, you think, they think of it as, as an exchange of, of, of goods or money. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's convincing someone to buy something and then running away, you know, like, like you're selling snake oil. But the way marketing works now, or, or, or the way it has always with, with good marketers, is it's about building relationships and it's about exchanging value. If you're giving your fans something that they are more than happy to part with their money for, you're trading their happiness for your your light bill, your electricity, your car, whatever you need to make a living in this world. So it's all about the perspective that you take and if you don't want to use those particular words, you know, that's fine. That's all semantics. But you've got to treat it like a business and marketing isn't a sleazy thing. It's just it's about building relationships and exchanging value. And if you can change your perspective on that, you won't feel so bad about offering what you do uh, as a as a product or, you know, for money. Yeah. And, and you raise a, an important word there, perspective, and, and I think mindset is a real battle for, for artists with the way that the new music industry is, is formulating, uh, particularly when it comes to things like releases and artists having to grasp this idea of I need to sell something if I'm going to be able to pay rent and eat and do all those kinds of things. What kind of a mindset, Lena? do artists need to get into when they're starting to look at going on the project of planning a release, release and, and how they're going to approach that? Because it mm. is quite an important element, don't you agree? Mm. Mm. Um, most uh, businesses fail, and I mean across the board, is because people in general have this, um, you know, uh, they have bad feelings towards the idea of sales. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sales, it's dirty, it, uh, you're, you know, ripping people off, you're, you're doing all this, kind, you know, that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, what I would say is, in terms of your mindset, if you already have a deep relationship with your fans, essentially they're pre-sold. You know, they, they, you, you're, in a way, you're kind of, you're not really helping them if you are building a relationship with them and then you have nothing for them to buy. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's like if they love your music, and they've been to see you live, and they love your stuff, and you, you know it's a service to them to provide them with something that they would like to own. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, selling is a human, um, a human attribute. We are all here, you know. We we all spend you know a, a large proportion of our time convincing other people to do other to to, to do things, mm -hmm. you know. So um, it's and so it's not about manipulation. Um, it's it's about influence. Um, and the best way to influence a person is to have a, a great relationship with them, you know. Um, and like I say, this is not. Um, it's it's looking at sales as. A service that you, you know, if you really feel that your music 
you know, is entertaining, it's there, it serves the fans, it contributes to, to art overall, any, whatever it is for you in terms of your contribution, then, um, then why wouldn't you want to take that to the world? And mm. the way you take that to the world as a business is via sales channels. See, so that's how you do it. So it's, it's in a way you have marketing. Marketing brings you leads, if you want to use that word. Um, but you, those leads need to be turned into sales. Okay. So, um, and there are various ways of doing that. You know, you, you, know, um, you start off with your pitch, you know, um, and your pitch is um, there. That's something that you, you go around, you know, something that you tell everybody. You could be at a dinner party and say, somebody says, what do you do? And, you know, you have your 30 second pitch. Um, or you could be, you know, at a networking event, or you could be pitching for investment, and that would be like your three minute pitch. That's kind of it. You know, there are different things that you pitch for, you know, rapport, partnership whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have other things like online, you know, you have sales processes online. So, um, and there are, there are many, many of those types of things. But um, the bottom line is, uh, you know, until we feel comfortable with sales, um, then, you know, we're not, you're not, you're not going to market your way into, into revenue. You can market and market and market and market. You need to have a sales system in place in order to convert those leads. <laughs> Excuse me. I think that you raise a really important point there and it's quite a, it, it hits home for me because I, mm -hmm. I've made that mistake and that's where we're trying to do things differently with this release. I haven't been sales orientated. I've been really engaging and you know put a lot out there with my fans and been very open with them but the one thing that I haven't been very good at is giving them enough stuff to buy. Uh, because with this latest, my latest album, it was an electronic dance music album, the DJs could go and, and gig it, so I didn't really need to gig. And, and the fans were consuming it, but there wasn't really anything that I was doing to give them more to buy. And so with this new album, that's a, it's a whole different ballgame. I realise that my next step as an entrepreneur is to learn how to make it easy for my fans to support me. We have a great relationship. We spend a lot of time engaging and I've invested a number of years in that. And now I need to give them the opportunity to support me the way that I know that they want to support me and I feel that that's where I've been letting my business down. It's been a real growth curve for me to understand that because all I was doing was why aren't they buying the album? Well, because the way that they want to buy the album isn't the way that I'm making the album available to them. And they may not necessarily want to buy the album. They may want to buy merchandise or peanut butter because that's a big part of my brand. When we sold the last single on peanut butter, we sold out. So mm -hmm. you know, these are important things to test. And, and leads us to a great, uh, a, a, a great element of this discussion. You know, we want to look at what the different ways to release uh, and we want to consider that in our plan. So, Carlos, I know you're big on direct-to-fan marketing. So, talk to us about the about direct-to-fan marketing and and how that works. Um, sure. Direct-to-fan marketing is basically cutting out all the middlemen, and it's it's kind of severing one of the biggest ties to the way the old industry used to work. And that's why it's really hard for a lot of musicians to take that step because it's kind of scary and unknown to them. Um, but it starts with just building a relationship, you know, like we've been talking about, and and then giving them the opportunity to buy directly from your website. You know, all the websites I build, I set up a store right there on their website. Um, just it's easy to connect with some PayPal buttons with a little picture of your album, or make a fancy sales page, or whatever you want. But that way, people are buying your album based on their relationship with you. So all you have to do is have that relationship with your email list and every now and again put a call to action in your, in, on your website, in your email blast that goes out on your Facebook page or whatever. And they can buy it direct, download, especially with downloads, directly from your website. Uh, PayPal keeps like 2.9%, you know, as opposed to iTunes. What do they keep, like 14, 15%, something like that, or any of the other digi digital distributors. You know, a lot of people really want to just cling to that and put, put their music on all those other sites, which which is fine, but the problems with that are that those other people keep your customer information or your fan information, you know, their email addresses. When they buy it through your site, you get their email address so that you can contact them again 
just to continue building to that that relationship or to let them know when you want to do something else. Um, when it's going, when it's on other distributors' websites, you don't get that. Um, and you, and and like I said, you also get a more of more of the money. Um, so it's all about building that relationship, selling them directly. Now, of course, I'm not saying don't put your music out there on all those other sites. It's still good to have it available. Usually, I recommend for my people that when they do the initial release, that they do it through their website first, and then a couple months later, once those sales are, you know, have pretty much peaked, then they can make it available on all those other sites. The other issue with those other sites is they don't help with discovery all that much. The people that buy that sell a lot of music on iTunes and and get streamed a lot on Spotify and things like that. They're people that have ads on the radio, on TV, you know, kind of label money pouring into their into their advertising to to get traffic that way. Bigger, more established acts that have been around for longer, and that model just doesn't work for most people. It simply doesn't. In fact, even the people that do take it that do get promoted that way, only three percent three percent of all musicians that are signed to labels ever make any money beyond their initial advance. So, you know, you think you're getting a lot by by getting that backing, but you're really not. And and you don't want to use the same outlets to to promote your music and especially sell your music because you're getting that chunk taken out of it, but you're not, not getting the benefits of at least maintaining and being able to build that relationship further with your fans. And, and I guess while director fan is a, a really great strategy for people to look at so that they can keep a bigger chunk of the pie, there are some disadvantages to director fan. Uh, what are some of those disadvantages, Carl? So you, you, I know that you're a big advocate for it, but what are some of the disadvantages oh, yeah. that you've noticed? There's, there's a, like I said, there's advantages and disadvantages. You know, it's it, not having it in as many places. It doesn't get discovered quite as easily. Yeah. You do have to do the legwork yourself to go out and get every individual fan. Um, but it, it saves you that money. So, I mean, you're not out there as much. And that's why I say you start with, with the really focused direct-to-fan efforts. But from there, expand and make your stuff available. Uh, to be discovered by licensing, you know, and you can even take your own steps towards building relationships with 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 uh, you know people in licensing, and 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 yeah. the key is really to defer to diversify. So you know, although direct fan is my specialty, you know, it's what I'm really good at. I still recommend that people check out all the avenues for income and work with what works best for them individually, but don't jump headfirst into some large agreement that you really don't fully understand just because you know that that's the way things have worked in the past. Yeah, yeah. Lena, what are some other release strategies other than director fan? Um, well, if I look at some of the, let's say, the past campaigns um, that I've run, um, you know, we work on the premise that it takes about seven to nine touch points um, before somebody uh, buys anything. So, I mean, you could, so you've got, let's say, you know, if you look at sort of, uh, you know, Marketing overall, it could be like email, mobile, website, social media, press, TV, another email, you know, another thing on social media, um, and uh, a blog somewhere, you know. So, I mean, it, so um, the way um, I would view it is um, I would look at all appropriate cha um, marketing channels. Um, and um, in terms of um, actual releasing it, depending on how far back you want to go, let's say you know you're doing you're, it's really early stages and you're just doing a grassroots campaign, then what you're doing there is you know you, for example you're kind of um, I would say um, going to your uh, main contacts in your in your database. Mm -hmm. um, you're looking for influencers. Um, you are um, and you know you're you're sort of Putting um, putting content and music out there in um, a little by little basis and getting people used to you. Um, so what we're doing here is that like we've got direct fan, but also you you know you you're utilising media as well. So um, you know you can and there's also the other thing that um, we do um, you know that that can be done is like using your local media, your local press, your um, local TV stations, your local radio stations. As well, and so um, and targeting those um, 
those entities can bring you loads and loads of support and loads and loads of local support as well. Um, so those are some of the ways that you can move forward and that actually um, has the effect of um, getting on um, the radar of um, bigger um, influences in terms of uh, in terms of the media as well so um, there, there is a there's you know there's always a value in looking in, at those avenues um, I find yeah go on go on sorry sorry no you, you. I, I find that um, I don't know whether it's because people look at what is going on with the majors uh, or not but I find that people are uh, and by people I mean the uh, artists in our industry currently. Mm -hmm. I'm finding again and again and I have for quite a few years now that people are in such a rush to find success and the element that what the industry is missing is that we have we have now joined every other business sector in the way that we do music. We are now small business owners. There is now if you want to rush a release, not plan it, put it out there and expect that you're going to have an audience that's going to consume that. You you really do yourself a disservice because you have this great product that you believe in, but you have no one really to preach to. Even if they're going to, even if they're going to consume it, they need to be primed. They need mm -hmm. to be finessed. They need to be prepared. Uh, there needs to be a romance and a courtship that happens between mm -hmm. you and your fans in preparing them to receive this new product and I feel that that's kind of the element that we're missing in the, the new music industry. I think that that's going to be kind of the defining factor of how we start to sell music again and how we start bringing uh, people back to wanting to engage a release. Uh, the, that whole idea of director fan works really well in that situation. The idea that you know you're building a relationship, expanding your network, uh, ex not not just with your fans, like you said, with m local media, talking mm. to them about what you've got coming up, and and bringing them on board with that courtship, and and having them finesse that. Uh, I guess the the build up to you know you're about to have a baby, and mm. and give it to the world, and, and and engaging everyone in that, and getting everybody excited in that is part of the planning process. So I wanted to talk to you, Carlos, about that idea. How do we prepare our fans and our audience for what's coming? Uh, I love that you describe it that way because I use a similar analogy in that, you know, building relationships with your fans is a lot like, like a dating relationship. I know I've run into so many musicians that just to walk, walk, you know, want to walk up to you and say, "Hey, nice shoes. Want to screw?" And that's their opening line. You know, I, I see that in terms of like on Twitter when I follow someone. My first message from them is, "Thanks for following. Buy my this. Check out my this. Vote for me here." You know, if you just say, "Hi, nice to meet you." Something about you. What kind of music do you like? Like for my own personal one, it's it, on my one of someone new meets me on Twitter. It's nice to meet you. Are you a musician? You know that yeah. opens up a conversation. You want to finesse a little bit and build that relationship and give it a chance to grow. Plant the seed. Let it grow. It takes time for any plants to grow, but then that plant grows. Then you can you know hit them with the hit them with what yeah. you've got. Um, so it's it's all about finessing that and giving the time it needs to grow. And I know a lot of musicians feel like they're in a desperate position and they're yes. in a hurry and it's got to be now or never. And 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 that's why they tend to steer away from just holding back a bit and just letting it grow naturally. But what I want you musicians out there to realize is that if you do it correctly, if you let it grow organically, that relationship, it will come a lot faster than you realize it. You know, you take a step forward every single day. And it may be a year from now, but if you just put yourself out there and build relationships naturally, a year from now, you'll look back and say, wow, this is further than I really imagined I would have come in a year, further than if I had had that overnight success that I was hoping for in the first place. Yeah, it's interesting. I was, as you said to me when, uh, right at the beginning of the conversation, when when you said you should start planning for a release 12 months in advance. 
I was remembering back to the beginning of my career, uh, maybe about eight years ago now, and if somebody had have said to me eight years ago, you need to be planning a release 12 months ahead, I would have freaked out. I'm going, I don't have 12 months, I'm already recording it. This thing needs to be done and dusted and out in three months. And my, my God, how my career has developed and, and moved since then because now it's this idea that this is a relationship. I, with every single person that engages my music, it is about building a relationship with them so that they can build a relationship with me and my music and have a greater experience of that. They don't feel that we're going for a one night stand. I don't want a one night stand with these people. I want a, I want a long term marriage with all of these guys and, and I think that a lot of artists, a lot of really great artists are putting themselves in an unnecessarily short term relationship by not, uh, by looking for instant gratification and that's going to shoot them in the foot. Um, and and I think that that's going to be the key element to turning an artist's career around is, is like you said, Carlos, you know, take a minute, take a breath, don't rush it and consider what you're trying to get out of this. Consider, am I looking to have a career in this or do I just want to be a, a, a one hit, nobody knows wonder? It's a, it's a really important part of that element, I believe. What are your thoughts on that idea, Lena? On the, on the um, idea, go on. So, on the idea that on the idea that fans rush in too, not fans, sorry, that, that artists are rushing in too quickly when it comes to, to that relationship with their fans? Um, well, I think that um, by and large, you know, if you, you know, if you're an artist and you're, you're kind of rushing in, you know, you're rushing to have that, I don't know, a quick fix, uh, a hit single, that kind of thing, um, I think it, it's a, by and large down to um, needing some level of significance. Um, and, and also um, need you know it, it is kind of like wanting to have that quick fix and like you say that instant that instant gratification um, and also I guess, I guess a sort of a, a level of youngness you know a little bit sort of like you know a bit kind of a bit green a little bit like wet behind the ears in terms of in terms of their experience you know and then you know maybe they 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 haven't they haven't been around and I don't, I don't mean like I mean, like, I don't mean young in terms of age. I just mean young, young in the game. Yep. Um, yeah. So um, I, that's that's really um, the way I see it. A, it you, any business, and um, particularly the music business, needs time to develop. You know, it does need time to grow, and it needs time to develop. And you know, even the best laid plans, you can have the the you can spend three months writing a business plan, and it it won't be, you know, your, the the way yeah. things transpire will not be the how you wrote it down. Okay, um, that's why they they always say business plans are a living and breathing document because you know you're you know you sometimes you don't even go back to your business plan because it's just not the way you write it down. So, um, and even marketing plans, you know, marketing and PR plans, things change um, and you have to adapt and be flexible. Um, so, um, it, it, this, um, this idea in terms of, of rushing into it, um, I think um, Label deals are, are, you know, are very few and far between, and I mean major label deals. You know, um, you know, this, you know, they're indies that you can sign to, um, and um, and I, I guess that you know there is a culture there that you know it's um, I'm using mu uh, music as a vehicle to be famous rather than maybe be an artist. Maybe that's that's actually part of it. Um, and what I would say to that is that if you will, you know, look at what you're trying to achieve. You know, do you want to be a musician? Um, do you have music that you want to take to the world? Do you have music that you would happily give to your fans to ha and let them take it to the world, or give to media and let them take it to the world? Mm -hmm. You know, that's I think is what it's about. Um, yeah. in t you know, in terms of what it. Or are you looking for celebrity? Because if you're looking for celebrity, there are easier ways to get that. There are easier ways to get <laughs> yes. it than being in music because. <laughs> Most there is a difference between music business and show business. Yeah, huge difference. Okay, so when you look at you look at those big stars, you know, and I mentioned you know Beyonce. I also you know 
worked with, you know, worked with Shakira, you know, those guys, they're in show business. Britney is in show business. That's who they are. That's what they aimed for. You know, yeah. they're entertainers, they're performers. Um, yes, they've used music business as a vehicle, but if you really look at them, they're in show business, okay? Yeah. And they are salespeople as well, okay? So um, that was the aim. That was the outcome for them. Okay, so uh, so you really, I, I think, what is your, what do you, what is your outcome? What do you want your legacy to be? And that's um, an, that's mm. that's integral, I guess, to the idea of an artist knowing what they're about. If if you're an artist who's about fashion, music, business, then then yeah. that's one way to formulate a release. But if you're an artist that's about releasing music that's going to engage your fans, that's going to tell your story, that's going to explore a, a political or a social agenda, uh, that's a completely different business and that, that kind of business takes a long time uh, to develop. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's the idea of release after release after release and monopolizing on what you've learnt from the re last release and the relationships you've built from the last release and growing that further. Mm -hmm. The idea that uh, you know, we, we've talked about what happens on the the aspect from the fan basis. You know, once we make a release, how do we build the relationships with our fans? How do we approach that? What are the different kinds of release strategies? Let's look at the back end of that. Carlos, who are the people that are involved on the back end of a release? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. Who are the people that are who are involved? Uh, from I guess from oh, a the business perspective, who are the people that are involved in helping an artist, or who should an artist consider from okay. the business yeah, perspective? Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, it cut out a little bit there, but and and here's it kind of wants, brings up a point I want to kind of mention is that as an independent musician, a lot of people think that the direct to fan or the DIY, uh, you know, strategies means that they're on a desert island doing this all by themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely not the case. Really, it should be referred to as BYOB, be your own boss. I learned that from Michael Branville, but it works great. You know, it, it doesn't mean you're alone. It means you are in charge of this small business of yours, and you need to put together, you know, you need to take responsibility, but put together the team of people that you need. You can't possibly be expected to know every process or understand, you know, how everything works. What you do need to do is figure out what your weaknesses are and get the experts to fill in those gaps. You know, on the back end, when you're putting your release together, and this is all stuff you need to put on your calendar. You need to pick your release date and start working backwards. You know, yeah. who's doing your art? How long is that going to take? How many revisions do you get from them before you have to start paying more money? Uh, who's doing the Mac mixing, mastering, recording? How long is that all going to take? And start working backwards on the calendar from that. Um, production, manufacturing, uh, shipping, distribution. And give yourself some leeway. If you're leaving stuff for, for the deadlines all the time, guaranteed you're going to miss something. You know, even stuff like your location. If you're, if you're in Minnesota in the middle of the winter, you know, be aware that there may be a huge snowstorm that stops your shipment at some point, you know, things like that. So who's going to fill in the gaps for you on everything you need to do? Maybe you have your own home studio. Maybe you do your own mastering. So, you know, you know what time you need for that, but you need to be aware of everybody's roles that's going to be in that, how long it's going to take them uh, to complete their role, and plan accordingly and give them enough time to do that. When you receive your... Uh, box of discs in the mail, that's not your release date. A lot of people treat that as their release date. That's your shipping date. Your release date is the time after that when you can distribute it to all the all the stores where you want to have that. You can get your uploads to all the digital distributors with enough time for them, you know, whatever leeway they need and, and whatever their deadlines are and, and enough time to double check your discs. You know, when you get your discs, put them in your computer, play them, make sure the ID3 tags are set, make sure that meta, metadata is there, you know, make sure they actually play. You know, it's not the it's not the, the presser's responsibility to make sure that all works. They're just pressing what you give them. So control your supply chain, know exactly who's all involved in what part and and just monitor all of that so all of that technical stuff whatever it is that you're not doing yourself those are all the people that you need to consider and, and be in communication with 
Lena, who would you add to that? There are a couple more people that 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 was fantastic, Carlos. There there are more people that need to be added to that list as well. Um, I would add a salesperson to that. You you'd actually put bring a salesperson on board. I'd bring a salesperson, yeah. I would I would get a deal maker in. Now that person would if that would that person is typically your manager. Okay, so yeah. if you look at the, you know the artists out there that you know there's you know that are out there currently they're salespeople. Look, you know, you know they have that about them, um, and the ones that um, aren't salespeople, you know, have a great manager who's a great salesperson, and that person is not selling to fans. Okay, what they're actually doing is they're out doing deals for you. So what they're doing, and you know, if we take bring it back, and I don't mean like big label deals or anything like that. I mean they're they're doing deals in terms of you know working with local local brands, you know, um, doing deals with um, somebody that's got a really, really great um, email list that you can do a collaboration with. They're helping you with the collaborations, that kind of thing. So um, they're going out there and building those business relationships, helping you with that aspect of it whilst you are off doing, you know, the more you're sort of, it's almost like you have a business supervisor and you have an artistic supervisor. Do you see what I mean? So it's like you've got those two those two roles, and it's so it means so it's like you don't have to think of all of those things. Now, I do think that there is a value in the artist being able to do those things themselves, but you can't do everything, and you can't be everywhere at once. You know, um, I would also add an administrator in as well. Mm -hmm. So, so like so some, you know, like a PA or a VA as well. Um, I would add, I would add that in in as well, and oh, I would build that team. On, um, as early as, as as possible, because you know you 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 know you run onto a pitch with your team. You don't run onto a pitch and kick the ball around solo and and hope that yeah. it's going to happen for you, right? You know you run on on with your team, okay? So get you know get those those people on board early. You know whoever they are, you know they would say, they come and work with me. This is what I'm doing. This is my vision. This is what I want to do. Let's go for a drink. Let's, like, let, let's start tomorrow. Let's open a bottle of champagne tonight. Whatever it is, whatever the, the celebratory ritual is for you, do that. Mm -hmm. But definitely have those two people on because the way you're going to make the quantum leaps in your sales is by doing those deals, is by um, collaborating with people. So, you know, um, in as much as you do want to go out and get the fans yourself, if you know that there is an, uh, a partner out there that has access to an audience that you can collaborate with, you know, that you can work yeah. with, then, you know, by all means, you know, work with them, collaborate with it's them, you know, swap email lists, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, if you can work with a brand that has, um, that, you know, has, you know, the right type of audience, then suddenly, you, you know, it's, you kind of, you know, you can open up your 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 audience like overnight. Boom, boom, boom. You know, you've reached all these people. Um, other things as well is that when you work with brands, and you know, there's um, brands. You know, go up and down. Um, you know, up and down in terms of of scale. But you know, and it's, so it's not in, entirely impossible to to get a deal with a brand. Um, but you know, so the small brands or, or brands that are kind of just starting out, you know, like smaller businesses, that kind of thing. You know, they very frequently they want to work with great artists, you know, because they they want the the kudos of working with great artists, and they are actually able to give you budgets to help you do some of the stuff that you want to do. You know, so um, I do know one artist that actually got a really great deal with a, a clothing company um, for surfers. And um, they gave her money to do her videos. They gave her budget wow. to do her videos. You know, all that kind of stuff. So it does happen. You know, um, you know, brands like Bacardi. You know, they will sometimes have um, like a sort of they kind of open their doors and they say, look, hey, you know, we're doing this campaign. We want to attract you know great new artists. Just please, you know, please apply. Um, I've seen Red Bull do it in the past. I think. Mm -hmm. um, Another, what's another other energy drink? Rocket is that an energy yeah, the, drink? Um, yeah, the beers, things like that. You know, um, you know, a lot of those guys go to festivals looking for this mm -hmm. kind. Of thing. So yeah. yeah, Monster, Monster is another one. They, they, a lot of brands are looking to partner with with the right people. The important thing is that, like for me, uh, 
for, for five or six years now, I've been signing everything off Peace Love and Peanut Butter. Whatever brand affiliation you have needs to make sense to your of fans. Of course, yeah. So okay. when I released a song on a peanut butter jar, my fans didn't go, what the fuck? My fans went, of course she's partnering with a peanut butter brand. I found, for me, it was the best peanut butter I'd ever tasted and I was talking about them without an affiliate. I didn't care that I had a, you know, an endorsement relationship with them mm. for the release of the album. I authentically love this peanut butter. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the best peanut butter in the world. And so when I happened, just by chance, a friend of mine introduced me to Pick, uh, of Pick's peanut butter. It was a very emotional experience. I did. I was a fangirl about it. I did cry. Um, and then I said to him, I want to release a song on a peanut butter jar. And he said, that sounds fucking awesome. And he's just as crazy as I am. So when we went to do something like that, it made sense to me, it made sense to him, and it made sense to the fans. If I was to go and do a, an endorsement deal with, uh, with Bacardi, though, mm. that wouldn't make any sense to my fans because I don't drink alcohol. Mm. So... Mm. That's that's the kind of thing that you want to approach as an artist is what's going to make sense for me as a brand. And if you go to a brand and you say to them, "Listen, I I am I wear Puma all the time," mm. you know, very. If 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 you go and and I don't personally wear Puma, but if you were an artist that said to Puma, "I wear Puma all the time," and I would love to keep wearing Puma, if you guys would spot the petrol for my tour and I'll wear Puma t-shirts the whole way through. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to Puma and it makes sense to you as an artist and to your fans. So, fans, yeah. And, and that's what needs to happen and these are the kind of things that need to become part of the planning process for, mm -hmm. for a project. I hesitate to call them releases anymore. Uh, for me, they're projects. And, <coughs> excuse me, as business owners, what we need to start doing is looking at it at that kind of a, a, a release, a project, as there's going to be a, a time of these 12 months in advance when I'm going to be creative, there's a time when I'm going to have my business hat on, there's a time when I'm going to be on tour, there's, there's different times when you're wearing different hats during the process from the beginning of the project to the end of the tour. And mm -hmm. the advantage of planning a release gives you the room to be able to know what you're going to what hat you're going to be wearing at, at each different times, so that you know in in the, the the middle three months of this twelve month project, you don't have to do anything other than be creative, and, mm. and that's a really great mindset and headspace to come from as an artist because I've noticed with previous projects I felt like I was on stage performing and trying to be a businesswoman at the same time as well as trying to think of well we you know we didn't sell enough seats or we've we've had to turn people away because we've oversold or whatever that is that doesn't work uh, it's it's never been a successful strategy for anyone mm -hmm. that that's trying to do something like that um, how have I guess I want to take it now to the idea of merchandise because we haven't covered merchandise and we haven't we haven't looked at where that fits. Uh, I know that that's a struggle for a lot of artists, particularly that are starting out in the planning phase, if they haven't had merchandise as part of their their release strategy. Um, let's start with you, Carlos. How do you approach that idea of knowing what merchandise to sell? Because it's it's I guess it's the thing that's the biggest cost. Uh, to an artist, if it doesn't work, if you if you invest in buying merchandise that isn't going to work, how do we minimal minimalize those those losses to the business? Uh, yeah, merchandising is a huge thing, and honestly, it's in some ways it's more important than than music sometimes because a lot of people at shows they want a souvenir, especially if you gave them a great a great time. There's a yeah. lot of ways to reduce the, uh, the the cost of that type of merchandise. There's companies where you just order, you know, a few at a time, and they kind of print stuff as you go, T-shirts, various uh, promotional items. So there are companies that, that actually help with that, so you don't have to maintain a lot of uh, a lot of stock. Can't think of any off the top of my head, um, but I know if you go, uh, there's a podcast, Mad Music Marketing Minutes, by Billy Grisak. He's the merchandising king. So if mm -hmm. you want to know some information about that, definitely go there. Um, 
but really merchandise again is 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 a more specific way to connect directly with your fans your music is your art what you're producing it, it it's it's all about you i i believe you should use your relationship with your fans use them as your muse for the music you're creating but your merchandise needs to be all about your fans um think of putting logos on t-shirts that are so awesome people would buy them and wear them if they're deaf or don't even know what your music is you know like yeah. the misfits uh kiss rolling stones people buy that stuff that don't even listen to their music um, and and another thing with T-shirts, instead of just putting your own promotional logo, especially if it's not awesome like one of those ones, put something that connects with your fans, like a lyric from a song that's really special, um, and do them in in limited runs. You know, only s make so many of these T-shirts once they're gone. You know, make a different T-shirt. But you want to find out what your friend, what your fans have in common, and and develop merchandise that speaks to them. Uh, one great way to actually to do that, to, to kind of research what, what your fans have in common is through your Facebook page uh, by using the graph search. I don't know if a lot of people have heard about it, but I'll just kind of mention it here because it can be really valuable in doing your marketing research. Um, but you can just uh, type in your little Facebook uh, search bar, uh, pages that fans of my band page like, and it'll come up with a whole list of, of things of commonalities between your fans and you can do a lot of different searches even when you're targeting your your marketing for your music you can say bands that fans of my band page like and you can find out what other bands they actually like and direct your efforts that way but That's you can also great. find out yeah and you can find out what they're into and, and 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 develop you know interests of people that like my band page you know if they're if they're all into camping you know maybe get a camp chair with your logo or something you know who, who knows what interest they might have in condom but your merchandise to be to be all about your fans it's a way for them to take the experience with them that they that you've given them so it's a great thing for shows and it's a great thing for uh, like I love the whole crowdfunding process if it's done correctly you know it's not like you're just pulling your fans burning those bridges and get some money real quick and then you won't have a chance with them again it's about giving them an experience developing products and merchandise that let them keep that experience with them for as long as possible and make them look forward to the next opportunity to do it. Because if you do crowdfunding right, you can do it over and over and people just want to participate over and over again. Um, so it's all about taking that experience home with you and very importantly it shows, especially your release show, you know, have a guy working the merch table, have it lit up, have it prominent and mention it from the stage. I don't know how many bands I've been to that have some stuff set up and don't even mention that they have some sales, you know, and, and acknowledge the people that buy your merch at the shows. Hey, look, Joe down here just bought a t-shirt. I'm going to buy him a shot, you know, buy the guy yeah. a shot from the stage. How many other people from the crowd are going to say, well, that was pretty cool. I want to go buy a t-shirt and dance in front of the stage with that too. You know, merchandise is all about the experience and making sure they know it's available. You don't have to even sell it or push it. You just have to show them a great time and let them know it's there and make it relevant to them. That's fantastic. That's that's such a great way to, I guess, wrap up a discussion about that idea because, it, you know, I think we've highlighted that. Uh, it, it is all about the planning and, and finding the success will be all about the planning but at the end of the day it's about having a good time and having a relationship, creating an experience through your release for you and your fans so that you can all converge somewhere and have a great fucking time. That's the point, isn't it? I guess that's, that's what we want to be doing as artists and as business owners. Uh, is creating something that means something to us and something to the fans and a meaningful exchange all at the same time. That was uh, that was awesome. So um, I guess we have a couple minutes left, guys, to, to ask the last question. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I I'm I didn't pr prime either of you before this, and and this is good. So it's going to be quite interesting. I'm going to start with you, Lena. What is the uh, one decision that you would have made differently in your career? You know, um, I got asked that question on a radio interview just last week. It's funny. Oh, brilliant! Really? Last week, yeah. And um, in terms of, I'm, I've, you know, I've actually reached, um, a, I've actually sort of reached, reached a stride in my business, and I'm, you know, I'm seeing the, um, I'm reaping, uh, you know. A, a, a lot of rewards for the work that I've, I've put in over the years. Um, so she and she asked me the same question, and I actually said, "You know what? Right now, I wouldn't have changed anything. 
The reason I would say I wouldn't have made a different decision, the reason I say that is because building a business, any type of business, is really, really hard work. It's tough. Mm. You have to do a you you have to do a lot of learning. Even if you've got loads of experience in the, in any industry in this industry, you've got to do a lot of learning. You've got to do a lot of soul searching. You know, um, I d you know, you could spend a lot of time crying over your laptop because you know you lost your hard drive. Failed. This happened to me. Um, couple, about well, a month ago, my hard drive failed. Yeah. Lost loads, lost, lost loads of files. All that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't cry, but I felt like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um and. Um, I, you know, I sort of came. I, you know, I, I sort of I went through that process of of losing all my work and with you know I hadn't really retrieved any of it really. But you know, just kind of like this clearing um, process for me, um, and then sort of magi sort of magically hitting a stride regardless of like having this kind of the crash of of June two thousand and fourteen. I call it, um, <laughs> and um, I thought actually I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change anything because I think once you have that experience and then you hit a stride, I think you, you kind of realize it's actually this is my journey and I really feel that I can own it. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can own it. And I, you know, I say that now because I, like, things are, you know, are good. You know, maybe yeah. you know, once, I hit, once I, I'm in sort of in growth, I'm, I'm luckily I'm, I'm growing, you know, we're in a, he in a recovery, it's kind of hesitant. So um, I'm growing and once I hit this plateau and it kind of dips a little bit, which inevitably it will, I might think, oh, actually, you know, I wish I hadn't made that decision before. Um, yeah. Right now, I'm I'm happy with all the decisions that I made. You know, I'm so, happy for um, you that that's where you're thank at. You. Thank you, thank you. I mean, you know, maybe if it was last year, I might have said, um, I don't know, what would I have said? What would I have changed? Nothing. Um, I don't know. I maybe I would have. Um, you know, there are certain aspects of 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 product creation that I might not have spent as long. A time yeah. on maybe you know, and I think that's probably that. Hopefully, that will resonate you know with some of your audience because you know it's it's one of those things I call it you know product hell, product development hell. You know, I maybe I wouldn't have you know I, I wrote um I, I've written a book and I would maybe wouldn't have spent so long on that. Maybe I would have put it out sooner. There's all that kind of stuff. But now, no, actually, I'm I'm you know I'm now I'm you're glad. in the sweet spot. Now I'm in the sweet spot. So I'm like yeah. <laughs> I did everything I perfect. I, I wouldn't change anything. <laughs> so, like I say, you know, I might change. I, I might rethink that in, you know, in a in couple a few of months years. time. Yeah, in, you know, in a, in a few months time will be next year. But I'm I'm happy with where I'm at now. So nice, nice. <laughs> How about you, Carlos? What a what's a decision that you would have made differently? Well. I wouldn't use this question as an opportunity to undo any decision I've made because mistakes are how you learn. You mm -hmm. know, I've fallen flat yeah. on my face. I've been dead broke. I've, you know, for the first while I was in business for myself, I lived in my van. You know, I've been on the bottom and I've made lots of mistakes. I spent lots of money and time on things that didn't work or a completely different direction from what I'm doing now. But it wasn't wasted money or wasted time. I got an education out of all of that, experiential yeah. education. So, you know, I would say the one thing I would do differently, the one thing I would change would just to be start start sooner. Get get in there, you know, dive in feet first, make those mistakes, learn from them, and, and move forward. I, I'm so excited about the trajectory I'm on right now that I know a year from now it's just is going to be even more amazing that, that the one thing I would change would be be here a year ago, you know, and be where I'll be at a year from now, now or whatever. You know, just just get started sooner, and get Amen. those lumps coming. And and I think that that what uh, is being emulated by both our guests here today is that fear and 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 I guess mistakes are not actually negative things when it comes to being an entrepreneur, uh, whether it be in the business, music business or any business. The idea of having a release and and, and you know, putting out an album or putting out a single or whatever way you decide to do that. Do I do a single first? Do I do an EP? Do I then turn that into an album? Whatever. Any decision you make is not a mistake. It's just an opportunity to experience different ways of doing things and learning how to grow from that as a business owner. And 
and nothing, you come back and you look at it no matter how shitty it feels right now, you will absolutely look back at it and get to a point where you think, well, I'm glad that that happened. I know that I didn't have money to eat at the time, uh, but I know I survived that and I know it made me a stronger person and, and it created me into the business person that I am today. And if you keep doing that again and again with every single release you put out there, you will grow, you will build your network, you will have more fans, you will be more successful and eventually you'll blink and you'll go, fuck, I'm actually a musician with a career and, and, and I'm doing this when other people aren't doing it and, and you will blow your own mind, really you will. And, and on that note, I want to I wanna thank Lena. Thank you for coming on the show. You're a well, huge, you. huge uh, inspiration to so many people. It's fantastic. So thank you for coming on. And, uh, and Carlos, you and your blog are amazing. Uh, and the things that you're doing for artists and encouraging them to go direct to fan and mentoring them through that and holding their hand through it is really creating some amazing things for the music industry. Thank you for, to both of you for what you are doing for, for artists worldwide. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Peace, love, and peanut butter, guys. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to Season 2, Episode number 12 of The Music Spring. If you missed any part of the episode, log on to YouTube after the show and watch this again. Check us out online. Search for The Music Spring on Facebook, Google+, YouTube, SoundCloud, or share on Twitter. Hashtag The Music Spring. To get involved, join the mailing list or for more information on the presenters in this panel, log on to our website, themusicspring.com. The Music Spring is free and always will be, but if you like what we do and find the information informative, please consider supporting us on patreon.com forward slash themusicspring. Tune in next week as we present music and accounting. See you then.